In the heart of Marshall, Minnesota, a tale of mystery and intrigue unfolds. Born on a cold winter's day in January 1989, Brandon Swanson was a young man with a promising future. He was a dedicated student at the Minnesota West Community and Technical College, studying wind turbines, a testament to his commitment to a greener, brighter future. On May 13, 2008, the academic year drew to a close, and Brandon, like his peers, celebrated the milestone. Two parties, two dorms, and a night of merriment, yet Brandon was responsible. He drank, but with caution, knowing he had a journey home to undertake. That he was fine, that he was not injured, and, you know, in fact, when we did find his vehicle, there was no damage to it. It was simply muddy from being on a gravel road, um, but no damage to the vehicle. As, as, you know, as Brandon tried to explain to us where his location was, and he was extremely sure of himself. He, he felt confident in, in where he was at. Um, and that we were the ones that were confused about, you know, how to get to him. And as the conversation went on, as the minutes ticked by, you know, it, it, it came to a point where as long as Brandon was on the phone, as long as he was talking, as long as we had contact, it was okay. We would be okay. But the minute that he, that that call dropped, I just became sick. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was very, very bad and just could hardly fathom. We, we didn't immediately hang up the phone. We, you know, we called his name. We tried to, you know, thinking that he still had the phone, that it was very near him, that he could pick it up. We'd he'd hear our voice and we, we called out to him several times and we realized, you know, he's, he's not there. Um, so we did. We called him back several times thinking, you know, he'll, he'll see the phone light up. Even if he didn't have it on ring, he would see his phone light up when the call came in and he'd find it. Um, it, it you know, he'd, he'd answer the call and it, it just didn't happen time and again. Just, it, it just went unanswered. As the clock struck midnight, Brandon bid his friends farewell, climbed into his Chevrolet Lumina, and embarked on what should have been a straightforward 30-mile drive back to Marshall. But fate had other plans. At 1.45 a.m., Brandon's journey took an unexpected turn. His car, now nestled in a roadside ditch, and Brandon, near blind in one eye due to a childhood injury, found himself lost and disoriented. He reached out to his parents, Brian and Annette, who immediately set out to find him. The night was dark, and Brandon's exact location remained a mystery. His parents, guided by his voice over the phone, searched for him along Highway 68, but to no avail. The only clue, the distant lights of a town, possibly Lind, a small town southwest of Marshall. With hope in their hearts, Brian and Annette directed their son towards the town, planning to meet at a familiar spot, a popular bar and grills parking lot. As Brandon trekked through the fields, his parents on the other end of the line, a sudden scream pierced the silence. Then, nothing. Attempts to reconnect were futile. Brandon's phone remained unanswered, and the chilling realization that something was terribly wrong began to set in. Despite their desperate pleas, local law enforcement dismissed their concerns, suggesting that it was not unusual for a young man to stay out all night. In the face of adversity, Brandon's parents found themselves pleading with Lynn's chief of police for help. Their pleas were finally heard, and a search party was assembled. Hours later, the abandoned Chevy was found, just as Brandon had described, nestled in a ditch, but Brandon himself was nowhere to be found. The search intensified, with multiple teams, bloodhounds, and helicopters scouring the area around Yellow Medicine County, where Brandon's cell phone was traced. A glimmer of hope emerged when one of the dogs picked up a scent, leading the search party along a three-mile trail towards an abandoned farm and then the Yellow Medicine River, but the trail ended there, abruptly, with no sign of Brandon. The theory that Brandon may have fallen into the river and drowned began to circulate. Despite thorough searches of the river, no trace of Brandon was ever found. As the days turned into weeks, the search was scaled back, and chances of finding Brandon alive dwindling with each passing moment. Yet. Hope was not entirely lost. Brandon's parents, along with their community, kept their porch lights on, a beacon of hope in the dark, signaling their belief that Brandon would return. They continued to search the area along the Yellow Medicine River daily for the next month. By the fall of 2008, a large cross-country task force was organized to search the freshly harvested fields surrounding Highway 68. 
Cadaver dogs picked up a scent of human remains in a previously unsearched area, but no physical evidence was found. Theories began to circulate, some suggesting that Brandon may have accidentally been killed by farming equipment. By spring 2011, despite a massive search covering more than 122 square miles, not a single usable lead was found. It was as if Brandon had just vanished from the face of the earth. Theories abound, but evidence is scarce. Did Brandon drown that night? Did he run away from home? Or was he a victim of foul play? The sheriff believes the latter, citing Brandon's final terrified exclamation as a clue. Could someone have been lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike? Some suggest that Brandon fell prey to a serial killer, perhaps a long-haul trucker. Others speculate that he was abducted and held captive, possibly trafficked. In the absence of solid evidence, all possibilities must be considered, no matter how eccentric they may seem. The hope that Brandon is alive and might one day return is a beacon in the darkness of uncertainty. The alternative is too grim to contemplate. A promising young man, snatched away from the world. His parents left to grieve, haunted by the memory of his last moments. If you've enjoyed this content from a universe of mystery, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Amanda Eller, a physical therapist who was lost on a hike in Maui, telling her story tonight for the first time since she was found after going missing for 17 days. Breaking news, a woman missing in Maui has been found alive. The news just coming in, Amanda Eller was last seen more than two weeks ago, and at this hour, she's being taken by helicopter to the hospital. A woman in Hawaii who was missing for 17 days after going for what was supposed to be a short hike. It did come down to life and death, and I had to choose and I chose life. In the heart of the Pacific Ocean, on the island of Maui, a tale of survival unfolded that captured the world's attention. A tale that speaks to the resilience of the human spirit, the power of hope, and the strength of community. This is the story of Amanda Eller. Eller's passion for holistic health and wellness led her to become a yoga instructor and then a doctor of physical therapy. She moved to Maui, Hawaii, where she worked as a physical therapist and yoga teacher. She was known for her love of nature and often spent her free time exploring the beautiful landscapes of the islands. Before her disappearance, Eller was described as a vibrant and healthy woman who loved the outdoors. She lived a lifestyle that was in tune with nature. She was also known for her spiritual beliefs, often seeking solace and peace in the natural world around her. On her website, she describes her life philosophy as follows. The body and its interconnected systems want to work in harmony. In its natural state, that's exactly what it does. It's a self-regulating, autonomous system that we can impact through injury, trauma, or negative emotional experience. When we get injured or have a pain that is unaddressed within the body, the system will compensate. Uncorrected, this can lead to a cascade of compensations that work to keep the body in movement, even though it becomes less functional over time. Long-term effects of a compensated body system include symptoms of chronic pain, inflammation, malalignment, lipping, and weakness, just to name a few. In order to heal the body, we must be willing to take a look at the bigger picture of what's happening within the system. This includes compensatory mechanisms, original injury, and other facets of healing that may be unaddressed. If these details are unaddressed, it can lead to a feeling of being stuck and in pain. The Makawa Forest Reserve, a vast expanse of lush greenery, home to a myriad of wildlife and a network of trails that weave through the dense undergrowth. It was here that Amanda set out for what was supposed to be a short hike. The Makawa Forest Reserve is a beautiful expanse of preserved woodlands located on the eastern side of Maui. It covers over 2,000 acres and offers a rich and diverse landscape for exploration. The reserve is home to a variety of indigenous flora, including cook pines, ferns, and rainbow eucalyptus trees, whose sweet, minty scent fills the air. The Makawa Forest Reserve is not just a place for exploration, but also a place for conservation. Visitors are encouraged to stay on the marked trails and avoid stepping on the plants along the edges. Amanda decided to try a new path, as many avid hikers do, and stopped to meditate and take a nap. When she woke up, she was disoriented. She had strayed from the familiar path and was now lost in the dense forest. But as the hours passed, Amanda didn't return. Her car was found in the parking lot and her wallet and phone was still inside. 
Amanda Eller, 10, 11 a.m. last Wednesday. She goes to a store wearing flip-flops, buys items for a Mother's Day gift. 10, 21, she mails the gift at the post office. That is the last image we have of her. Now, at some point, she drove to the Makawao Forest Reserve. Her locked car was found the next day when she was reported missing. Inside, the same flip-flops, her purse and phone, the keys hidden under the front tire. A massive search operation was launched. Hundreds of volunteers, helicopters, drones, all scouring the jungle and streams for any sign of Amanda. The search gained national attention, but days turned into weeks with no sign of her. The search continues for a hiker who went missing on Maui. The parents of Amanda Eller are now offering a $10,000 reward for any information leading to her safe return, according to the Maui News. She was believed to be hiking Wednesday on a trail in the Makuau Forest Reserve around 12 miles from her home, according to CBS Honolulu affiliate KGMB. She was reported missing Thursday when she didn't return home. Dozens of first responders searched the area on foot and by air for that 35-year-old. I'm Ken Molestina for WJZ.com. Amanda was not prepared for a long stay in the wilderness. She was wearing only a tank top and capri-style yoga pants. She had no food, no water, no shelter. She was truly alone. Her family and friends held on to hope, refusing to give up. I think they've done everything they, that they know they can do, and I'm, I'm satisfied with that. But hundreds of volunteers continue to look for her. We don't know if it's just a hiking injury um, or if there's foul play. That's Amanda's boyfriend, Benjamin Conkle, the last person to see her Wednesday morning. He volunteered for and passed a lie detector test. Police say he is not a suspect. And they have no evidence of foul play. I hope she's in the forest, but if someone has taken her, and we, we're not interested in you, we just want our daughter back. They know Amanda as a fighter, a survivor, and they were right. Amanda had to rely on her instincts and knowledge of the wilderness to survive. She ate guavas, random plants, and even moths. She drank water from streams, careful to choose clear water to avoid bacteria. She faced physical challenges as well. She fractured her leg and tore the meniscus in her knee after falling off a 20-foot cliff. She was swept away in a flash flood while trying to clean her shoes. Some nights, she slept in the mud and eventually even slept in a wild boar's den for the shelter and warmth. After 17 grueling days, Amanda was found. 17 days missing in a Maui jungle. No phone, no GPS, no supplies. You have a choice to make. You could sit on that rock and you can die, or you can start walking down that waterfall and choose life. She was injured, sunburned, and had lost 15 pounds, but she was alive. Amanda's story is one of determination and survival. She chose life, even when faced with the harshest of conditions. She pushed through fear and despair, driven by the will just to survive. Troy Helmer and Chris Burquist discovered Amanda Eller clinging to life on a waterfall in the Hawaiian rainforest. As soon as we saw her, it was like, oh my God, we got her, we got her. The Calvary arrived. What were to her first words? To be entirely honest with you, I don't remember because it was so incredibly overwhelming. We were all crying and screaming and laughing. Then for the first time in more than two weeks, she called her dad. It was just nothing but pure emotion. I have the most gratitude and respect and appreciation. I can't even put it into words for the people that have helped me, for the people that have prayed for me. Most of those volunteers, like Chris and Troy, had never met Amanda before, but now they say they feel bonded for life. After listening to Amanda's story, we are left with a profound sense of awe and respect. Awe for the indomitable spirit of a woman who refused to surrender to the harsh elements and respect for the sheer resilience of the human spirit when faced with the most daunting of challenges. Amanda's story is a stark reminder of the power of survival, hope, and resilience. It's a testament to the strength that lies within each of us, often untapped until we are pushed to our limits.
In our day-to-day lives, we often let small problems and inconveniences bother us. We fret over traffic jams, worry about deadlines, and stress over minor disagreements. But when we are forced to stare death right in the face, as Amanda was, we realize how trivial these problems truly are. When faced with the prospect of death, Amanda chose life. She battled the elements, fought off despair, and clung on to hope, which is nothing short of inspiring. Her story reminds us of what is truly important in life. It's not the daily aggravations that define us, but our relationships, our community, and our willingness to help others. It's about the love of family, the support of friends, and the kindness of strangers. It's about the strength of a community that comes together in times of crisis, and about the power of hope that can light the way even in the darkest of times. In the grand scheme of things, it's not the day-to-day problems that define us, but how we respond to the challenges that life throws our way. And, as Amanda Eller has shown us, with hope, resilience, and the support of a community, we can overcome even the most daunting of challenges. If you've enjoyed this content and this inspirational story, please consider like, sharing, subscribing, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new content. Thank you for watching this video from A Universe of Mystery. Stay prepared, stay safe, and stay curious. Nestled in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park is a treasure trove of natural beauty and mystery. It's the most visited national park in the United States, and within its vast expanse lies the Cades Cove. This picturesque destination, favored by those with a taste for the intriguing, is a popular hike for both locals and tourists who appreciate the allure of the unknown. The cove is a labyrinth of lush foliage with an 11 mile loop road that snakes through the landscape. It's a journey that offers more than just scenic beauty. It's a chance to glimpse the park's diverse wildlife, a thrilling prospect for those who relish the thrill of the unexpected. The area is also dotted with historic structures, each with its own tale to tell, and the seasonal scenery provides a stunning backdrop, particularly in the spring and in the fall. For those who wish to delve deeper into the mysteries of the park, the Cades Cove Campground offers the perfect base. With numerous hiking and biking trails, it's an opportunity to immerse yourself in the park's unparalleled beauty. Cades Cove is a magnet for those intrigued by wildlife. Whether you prefer to drive through or camp, the cove offers ample opportunities to observe a variety of creatures. From commonly sighted deer and black bears, to the more elusive coyotes, groundhogs, turkeys, and raccoons. For many, including the Martin family from Knoxville, Tennessee, Cades Cove holds a special place in their hearts. For generations, they've made an annual trip to the Smokies on Father's Day weekend, specifically to camp and hike in the Cades Cove. Their love for this beautiful area and unique experience it offers continues to draw them back year after year, each visit uncovering new adventures. One such adventure began on June 13, 1969, when William Martin, his two sons, Douglas and Dennis, and his father, Clyde, embarked on a Father's Day weekend adventure. This was Dennis's first such adventure with his father, and the group planned to hike the 13-mile loop trail from Russell to Spence Field in the Cades Cove. Both William and Clyde were experienced hikers, familiar with the trail's terrain and its hidden surprises. Even Douglas, at just nine years old, had hiked the trail before and was familiar with it. At the age of six, Dennis was no stranger to family hikes. He was able to match the group's pace as they embarked on their journey from Cades Cove. Their path led them through the serene Abrams Creek and past the junction of the Crib Grab Trail. As they pressed on, they reached Russell Field, a place that could soak in the awe-inspiring scenery and relish in the wilderness. On the evening of June 13th, upon their arrival at Russell Field, the Martin family rendezvoused with Dr. Carter Martin, a family friend from Huntsville, Alabama, and his two sons. Despite the shared surname, there was no blood relation between the two Martin families. The following morning, June 14th, the group embarked on a 90-minute hike along the Appalachian Trail toward Spence Field, a location famed for its breathtaking view of the mountain laurel in full blossom during June. Upon reaching Spence Field, they were welcomed by other family members who had also made the trek. After a leisurely late lunch, the Martin children and Dr. Martin's children began to play. During this time, Dennis's father, William, overheard the boys conspiring. They were plotting a playful scheme to run on the edge of the field and sneak around, and then surprise the adults. To ensure the success of their plan, they instructed Dennis, who was wearing a bright red t-shirt, to walk alone so as to not give away their surprise. William watched the boys, amused by their laughter and camaraderie, as they planned the surprise attack. 
Post lunch, Douglas Martin teamed up with Dr. Martin's son and set off in one direction, while Dennis, still in his bright red t-shirt, ventured off alone in another direction. William, Dennis's father, watched his son walk away for a few minutes before turning his attention back to the rest of the group. When the children sprang their surprise on the adults a few minutes later, it took a moment for anyone to notice that Dennis was not among them. William had assumed that Dennis would eventually join the others and was not immediately concerned. However, it took less than five minutes for a sense of unease to creep in as William realized that Dennis was not with the group. The family dispersed, their voices echoing through the wilderness as they called out for Dennis, but their calls were met with silence. A sense of panic began to grip William as he and the others combed the area. Despite their frantic search, they found no trace of the young boy. William Martin was particularly distressed, as Dennis was a reserved child who always responded when his name was called. In a desperate bid to find his son, William decided to head in one direction, while his father, Clyde, went in the opposite direction. William traced the nearby Appalachian Trail, heading west and calling out for Dennis as he went. He traversed a mile before turning back towards Russell Field, then retraced his steps all the way back to Spence Field, thinking that Dennis might have gotten disoriented and followed the path they had taken earlier in the day. Despite his exhaustive efforts, there was still no sign of Dennis. A defeated and exhausted William returned to Spence Field alone. This was 1969, a time before cell phones or quick means to call for help. Clyde, Dennis's grandfather, realized they needed assistance and decided to hike to the nearest ranger station at Cades Cove, a daunting nine miles away. It took Clyde several hours to reach the ranger station, and by the time he arrived it was already 8.30 p.m. He reported Dennis missing, and the rangers immediately initiated a search and rescue operation. As the search for Dennis commenced, a storm rolled in, adding another layer of complexity to the already challenging task of finding the young boy. The area where Dennis was last seen was known for its intricate terrain and potentially dangerous wildlife. The heavy rain further escalated the daunting situation. Despite the challenges, a few rangers immediately began searching the immense area around Spence Field, where Dennis had last been seen. They informed dispatch that they planned to search through the night in hopes of finding the missing boy. In 1969, there was no established large-scale search and rescue operation plans in place for the Smoky Mountain National Park. Chief Ranger Sneedon organized a search crew and set up a headquarters camp at Spence Field where they strategized their efforts to locate Dennis. The search for Dennis Martin commenced on the morning of June 15th with the crew hopeful of making headway in their mission of finding the missing boy. Initially, the search party was composed of 30 men, including 5 leaders and 10 additional crews of 2-4 to four men each. However, as the search progressed, more volunteers flocked to the site to lend their support. By 1 p.m. on June 15th, the search party had swelled to 240 people, but there was a glaring lack of leadership and coordination among them. As the days passed, the search for Dennis attracted an increasing number of participants, including Boy Scouts and rescue squads from North Carolina. They brought in jeeps, trucks, and helicopters to aid in the search effort. Eventually, the search party would comprise more than 1,400 people. The sheer number of search teams and volunteers may have inadvertently impeded the search. There was no established search and rescue operation plan for the park at this time, and the search lacked a clear chain of command. Consequently, searchers were more likely obliterating evidence or any clues that could lead them to Dennis Martin. Despite the number of people involved in the search, Dennis remained missing. As the search for Dennis Martin continued, a myriad of ideas and theories were proposed about his possible fate. Some of these came from psychics and fortune tellers who reached out to the authorities offering assistance. One psychic from Los Angeles claimed to have seen the boy two and a half miles to the left of where he had last been seen by his father or brother. According to this psychic, Dennis had fallen off a steep area and was now ensnared in the bushes, but still alive. Another psychic from New Orleans suggested that the search should shift from the ground to the trees and the tree chops to find Dennis. These were just a couple examples of the dozens of calls that the search team received from psychics who claimed they had information that could lead to Dennis. Despite the search leaders following up on every call, they all turned out to be dead ends. After a week of unsuccessful searching, the FBI was called in to investigate whether there was any indication of foul play or a potential kidnapping. The FBI only gets involved in a missing person case if there is a suspicion of a crime. FBI agent Jim Wright was assigned to delve into the background of the Martin family to see if anyone could have had a motive to harm or abduct young Dennis. 
After an exhaustive investigation, the FBI found no evidence of any adversaries or suspicious individuals linked to the Martins. The absence of any concrete leads led the FBI and the Martins to redirect their search efforts back to the Smoky Mountains. The Martin family cooperated fully with the authorities, trying to recall every detail from their arrival at the Great Smoky Mountain National Park until the last moment when William saw Dennis walking away from the group. They recounted everything that had transpired during the initial search for Dennis in the hours before Clyde Martin reached the ranger station. Dennis went missing around 4 p.m., and it took Clyde until 8.30 p.m. to reach the station, leaving a four-and-a-half-hour window. The family searched the immediate area and enlisted the help of anyone around Spence Field who offered to assist. The FBI interviewed friends, family, and acquaintances, but found no enemies or suspicious individuals connected to the family. Thus, they returned to the Smokies to continue the search for Dennis. The Martins raised some red flags and alerted authorities to investigate potential leads. One such lead was an unnamed man from Dandridge, Tennessee, who had been camping at Spence Field around the time of Dennis's disappearance. William Martin, Dennis's father, reported to park rangers that this man, referred to as Mr. Cooper, seemed to stay close to William during most of the search efforts. Adding to the mystery was an unknown woman claiming to have extrasensory perception. She contacted the police department and requested to speak with Dennis's mother. After speaking with the woman, Miss Martin was advised to be cautious of Mr. Cooper from Dandridge. Concerned that the woman and Mr. Cooper might be collaborating to abduct Dennis, Miss Martin shared this possibility with the police. Despite the potential lead, there is no public record indicating that the authorities found the situation suspicious enough to launch a further investigation. Nevertheless, the Martins noted these strange occurrences and felt they warranted attention. As the search for their missing son Dennis continued, the Martins grew increasingly desperate for any explanation that could help offer hope for his safe return. They considered every possible scenario that could have led to Dennis's disappearance, including the idea that someone may have confused their family with another. However, there is no publicly available evidence to suggest that this theory held any weight. Contained within the publicly available files related to the investigation into Dennis's disappearance are several intriguing leads and witness statements. Among these is the account of a man named Harold Key from Carthage, Tennessee. Harold and his family were in the park on the day Dennis went missing. They were in the Sea Branch area, located roughly seven miles from Spence Field, near Rowan's Creek. According to Key, he heard a disturbing scream that afternoon, which prompted him and his wife to scan their surroundings, fearing that one of their children might be under attack by a bear. Shortly thereafter, Key spotted a suspicious-looking man moving swiftly through the nearby woods. He recalled that the man appeared to be intentionally avoiding them, and described the man as rough in appearance. Several days after Harold Key and his family were in the park, they returned home and learned of Dennis Martin's disappearance through news reports. He immediately reported his account of the sickening scream and rough-looking man to park officials. However, after investigating the matter, park officials determined that Rowan's Creek was too far from Spence Field for the incidents to be related. The search for Dennis persisted for seven grueling days, and on June 20th, Dennis's seventh birthday, park ranger records show plans were being made for the grim possibility of not finding him alive. With over 1,400 volunteers participating in the search, concerns arose that uncoordinated efforts could be causing more harm than good. As a result, park officials requested volunteers cease joining the search, which had then covered over 56 square miles. As the search for Dennis Martin continued, the cost mounted. Despite the massive efforts from volunteers and law enforcement, the hope of finding Dennis alive began to wane. On Wednesday, June 25th, park officials announced that the search for Dennis Martin would soon be concluding. For the Martin family, the news was crushing. After nearly two weeks of camping out and searching tirelessly for their son, they had to pack up and return to Knoxville with heavy hearts. The uncertainty surrounding Dennis's disappearance and the lack of answers only compounded their anguish. As the search for Dennis Martin dragged on without any solid leads, the National Park Rangers made the difficult decision to suspend all major search operations on Sunday, June 29th. Despite their best efforts, they had come up empty-handed, and the FBI had found no evidence to support theories of Dennis being kidnapped. In the weeks that followed, the Martin family clung to hope for any information that could lead to their son's safe return. They offered a reward of $5,000, equivalent to about $40,000 today, for anyone who could provide credible information about Dennis's whereabouts. 
However, as time passed and the search efforts yielded nothing new, park officials had to make the tough call to officially close the search for Dennis Martin on September 11, 1969. The Martin family was left with no answers and the haunting memory of their son's disappearance in the Great Smoky Mountains. The disappearance of Dennis Martin has remained a mystery for over half a century, with no definitive answers as to what happened to the young boy. Various theories have been proposed, including the possibility that he became lost in the rugged terrain and perished due to the elements or an attack by wildlife. Over the years, several tips and leads have emerged. One notable tip came in 1985, when a group of illegal ginseng hunters stumbled upon what appeared to be the remains of a small boy in an area about three miles from Spence Field. The hunters found a skull and other remains, but fearing arrest, almost two decades passed before one of the men called in the tip. With a search team finally looking for the remains, they came up empty-handed, as too much time had passed. According to a report by park officials, the search for Dennis was a marked failure. Despite the presence of many people on the scene, any possible evidence that could have been preserved was likely trampled upon by the numerous individuals who came to offer their assistance. The failure to properly coordinate and organize the search for Dennis Martin prompted the National Park Service to completely overhaul their search and rescue operations across all national parks. As a result of these changes, agencies all over the United States and the world have also adopted these new protocols, which ultimately have resulted in saving lives. Despite the positive outcomes of these changes, it is heart-wrenching to know that they came too late to rescue Dennis Martin. His disappearance remains an unsolved mystery, and his tragic case has served as a catalyst for reforming search and rescue procedures across the country and across the world. If you've enjoyed this content from a universe of mystery, please like, subscribe, share, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Today, we'll delve into the tragic and mysterious disappearance of Michael Paul Lemaitre, who went missing during the 2012 Mount Marathon race in Seward, Alaska. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more intriguing stories like this one. So let's dive in. Mount Marathon, located in Alaska, is well known for its annual race held on the 4th of July. This challenging 5K features a grueling climb and descent with an elevation gain of around 3,000 feet. The race is not for the faint of heart and competitors must navigate steep, treacherous terrain. Originating in 1915, the Mount Marathon race has become a beloved tradition for both the local community and the adventurous runners worldwide. Each year, hundreds of participants flock to Seward, Alaska to test their limits and conquer the mountain. However, the race has also seen its fair share of accidents, injuries, and even a few fatalities. On July 4, 2012, a 65-year-old Michael Paul Lemaitre took part in this iconic race. He was a devoted husband, father, and grandfather, and an avid runner. Little did he know that this race would be his last. As the day unfolded, Lemaitre would vanish without a trace, leaving behind a heartbroken family and a community searching for answers. Paul Lemaitre was not an elite athlete, but he was passionate about running and eager to participate in this challenging event. Despite the inherent risks, he was determined to prove himself and conquer Mount Marathon. Lemaitre was last seen near the summit of Mount Marathon, lagging behind other racers. Although he was not as fast as some of his younger competitors, his determination was undeniable. When he failed to return after the race, his family and friends grew concerned. It wasn't long before search parties were dispatched to comb the mountain for any sign of him. The following is the actual search party featured on the hit TV show, Alaskan State Troopers. I got called to search and rescue. A 66-year-old male went up over the top, last seen about 6 p.m till about 9.30 right now. This is this man's first time running this mountain. Um, got a helo on standby. We're gonna have a spotter go up with him and see if they can find him. We do have less visual of him at the top of the mountain. These two cliff areas, this is a 300 foot drop right here and this backside is, is fishes. The troopers can't waste any time. In less than an hour away, the temperature will drop to around 40 degrees. We got about 40 minutes or so of daylight. I'm gonna start pulling people off here pretty soon. Okay. All right. Too dangerous for you guys to be up there. I understand. Right night. Mm -hmm. 
Mount Marathon frequently attracts novice racers who fail to recognize the peril, a blunder that some may not have a chance to repeat. Troopers dispatch seasoned hiker David Lorraine to scale the mountain slopes. I have knowledge of this mountain, and um, if we have any search and rescues on this mountain, I'm the one that's supposed to respond to it. So that's where they wanted me to go. The path that existed earlier today is transformed into a money torrent where a single misstep could result in a fatal plunge equivalent to a 30-story descent. So they put this trail in to bypass these rocks here to come up, but as you can see, this trail is pretty, pretty slippery. People are, you know, they're just coming down fast and they slip on the slippery rocks and next thing you know, it's a, a good little drop down. To, uh, to the bottom of the chute there. Clearly, the higher you go, the colder it gets. Uh, hypothermia, you, especially when you get damp and in, in these conditions in a rainforest type of environment, it can set in really fast. A cry for help gets the trooper's attention, but it's a female voice. You in the trees? Can you see me? I'm coming. Just stay there, don't move. You aren't cut up or anything? Okay. Pretty cold? Yeah. Is there okay. like down there, is there like anywhere I can go in? Yeah, we'll get you help. She had a pair of running pants on, they were ripped. Um, I did see a little bit of blood. Um, she was shivering, she was sopping wet, she was stuck. Okay, this is really bad right here. Yeah. Twenty-one forty-two. 2142. 42. This was right on the bottom. I don't know if it could be a clue or something. It was just right here at this last part. Yeah, of course. That's not his? I don't know. Is it? Do we know where the family is? One of them's in here. In the back on the couch there. Did you see what he was wearing this morning by chance? I didn't. Okay. Where was that located at? It was on the mountain, Let's go down low. Dude, Come on. But, uh, probably not. As daylight fades, the ground searchers decide to suspend their efforts until morning. However, with Lemaitre at risk of succumbing to the freezing temperatures overnight, a final attempt is made to locate him using an aerial thermal camera. The weather, the rain coming down, if they find this guy, they've got to offload the trooper in the dark. The temperature's down pretty low. With that thermal camera, we'll be able to spot him pretty quick. He's going to stick out like a sore thumb up there. Landing could mean a couple of different things. They could be having trouble with the helicopter, or they could have found the subject. They could be trying to get down to him. OK, so if you, no, no, no contact with him right now. The helicopter searches throughout the night and into the next day and finds nothing. It's been over 72 hours. During this time frame, I've probably received about 10 hours sleep. I'm going to kind of go home and try to reprocess and reorganize things. It really teaches you to focus what's important in life because none of us really know what the future holds. All we really have is the now. Searchers comb the mountain day and night using helicopters, dogs, and ground teams in an effort to locate Lemaitre. They searched every possible trail and even ventured off the established paths, hoping to find any clues that might lead them to him. 
But as the days wore on and the search area expanded, the chances of finding him alive began to diminish. The search for Lemaitre was extensive, with authorities, volunteers, and family members scouring the mountain and its surrounding areas. Despite their efforts, no trace of him was ever found. The search was eventually called off, but his family continued their quest for answers, determined to uncover what happened to their beloved Paul. Over the years, various groups and individuals have returned to Mount Marathon to continue the search for Lemaitre. Some have even claimed to have found personal items that may have belonged to him, but to date, no definitive evidence has been uncovered. Lemaitre's disappearance not only left the family in mourning, but it also raised serious questions about the safety of the Mount Marathon race. In the wake of this tragedy, race organizers implemented improved communication systems and increased safety measures to ensure the well-being of future participants. They also established cutoff times for racers to reach specific checkpoints, providing a better way to monitor their progress and ensure that no one is left behind. Additionally, the race now requires participants to carry a personal tracking device, which allows organizers and emergency personnel to locate them in case of an accident or an emergency. These changes were made in the hope that no family would ever have to endure the same heartache that Paul Lemaitre's loved ones face. The disappearance of Michael Paul Lemaitre remains shrouded in mystery. Some speculate that he may have succumbed to the harsh Alaskan wilderness or perhaps encountered a wild animal. Others suggest that he may have become disoriented and wandered off the trail. Despite the many theories, there is still no concrete evidence as to what truly happened. Lemaitre's story has captured the attention of the public and the media, with many drawn to the unsolved mystery and the unwavering determination of his family to find the answers. Their continued search serves as a testament to their love for Paul and their desire for closure. As we remember Michael Paul Lemaitre and his family, we're reminded of the importance of staying safe and vigilant in the great outdoors. This tragic story serves as a cautionary tale for all adventurers. Today, we're uncovering the chilling story of Kenny Beach an experienced hiker who vanished while searching for the enigmatic M Cave in the Nevada desert. What happened to Kenny and what secrets does the M Cave hold? Stay tuned to find out. But before we start unraveling this eerie tale, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Click the notification bell so you don't miss any updates. Now, let's begin. Kenny Veach was a seasoned adventurer, always eager to explore uncharted wilderness. In October 2014, he posted a comment on YouTube claiming to have discovered a mysterious cave shaped like the letter M near Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. According to Kenny, upon approaching the cave, he felt an unusual vibration that caused his body to tremble, and a sense of fear overtook him. Intrigued by this experience, he vowed to return and investigate further. This ain't nothing. I am a long distance hiker. One time during one of my hikes up by Nellis Air Force Base, I found a hidden cave. The entrance to the cave was shaped like a perfect capital M. I always enter every cave I find, but as I began to enter this particular cave, my whole body began to vibrate. The closer I got to the cave entrance, the worse the vibrating became. Suddenly, I became very scared and hightailed it out of there. That was one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. Determined to uncover the truth behind the M Cave, Kenny embarked on a solo hiking expedition in 2014, armed with his camera to document the journey. He uploaded a video on his YouTube channel detailing his search, but ultimately returned empty-handed. Undeterred, Kenny announced his plans to venture back into the desert to locate this mysterious cave once again. Unfortunately, this would be the last time his friends and family would ever hear from him. The following is excerpts from the actual video that Kenny posted while he was exploring for the cave. Well, here I am on my hike up here in the mountains north of Las Vegas. This is the uh, this is a canyon I just walked up in. Now you can't tell, but my truck is way out there by the mount mountains at the very very end of this valley. It's kind of like a big canyon. Uh, on the other side of these mountains, I'll show you in a second, are the uh, is the bombing range, the Nellis Air Force bombing range. Um, they do a lot of practice stuff out there. This is an old mine, and there's a hole here that just goes. Whew, 
way down. My mission today is to uh, just do a one day hike. It's about 10 hour hike. Um, I got to still go over another ridge and then go all the way down uh, a big crevice. It's real narrow and gets kind of scary. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for a cave that I, I found and I didn't have a I didn't have a sidearm when I was here before and something about that cave just spooked me out of all the caves I've ever gone in. This one just made my body vibrate. The closer I got to it, the crazier my body felt and I was like, all right, I'm not going to go in there right now, but I'm coming back someday. And I talked to some people on YouTube and I told them, hey, I'm coming out here, you know, because they, they kind of called my hand on it. So I don't know if there's going to be anything to it, but it, it might be interesting. Uh, if I can find it, I got to relocate it. And this is a big mountain range I'm in and uh, I'm not, I'm on foot, you know, my truck's way out there. There's no roads. There's no trails. It's a pretty rough terrain. So uh, hopefully I'll find it. It's shaped like a big M. It's a big cave that looks just like a gigantic M. And it's about as tall as I am and kind of narrow. And uh, it's stuck on the side of a mountain. Uh, so I hope I can find it again. And if, if I do, I'm, I'm going in there. I'm going to put on my light and take my gun out and walk in there, see if I find anything. We'll see. On November 10, 2014, Kenny set out for his fateful expedition. After he failed to return, a search party was dispatched to comb the desert for any trace of the missing hiker. On November 22nd, his cell phone was found near an abandoned mine shaft, but there was no sign of Kenny. The search continued for weeks, but to no avail. Kenny Beach's disappearance has fueled various theories and speculations, including an accidental fall. Kenny might have fallen into the numerous mine shafts scattered throughout the area or encountered treacherous terrain, which led to a fatal accident. Exposure or dehydration. Kenny could have succumbed to the harsh desert conditions, such as extreme temperatures, lack of water, disorientation, ultimately leading to his demise. Foul player abduction. Some speculate that Kenny may have encountered someone with ill intentions or stumbled upon a dangerous situation such as drug runners or smugglers that resulted in his disappearance. Another theory suggests that Kenny might have chosen to disappear and start a new life elsewhere, leaving no trace of him behind. Supernatural or unexplained phenomena. Some believe that the MK may hold dangerous secrets or be connected to paranormal events, which could have played a role in Kenny's disappearance. After all, he claimed the M cave was located in the heart of UFO Valley, at the center of where everything happened in the Nevada desert. Where he was, was very close to Area 51 and also Nellis Air Force Base. These bases are often talked about by UFO theorists. Kenny Veach's tragic disappearance serves as a chilling reminder of the dangers that lurk within the vast wilderness of our national parks. While the enigmatic M Cave continues to elude discovery, Kenny's story lives on throughout his YouTube videos and the unwavering determination of those who continue to search for answers. What do you think happened to Kenny Beach? What secrets does the M Cave hold? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for joining us on this journey at a universe of mystery. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with fellow mystery enthusiasts. Until next time, stay curious, safe, and prepared as we continue to unravel the world's most intriguing mysteries. Be sure to check out our other videos exploring unsolved disappearance and mysterious phenomena. If you have any suggestions for future videos or cases you'd like us to cover, please leave a comment below. We're always eager to hear from our viewers and learn about the mysteries that captivate your imagination.